Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Check, testing. One, two, three, four.
This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'd like to welcome everyone to the worship of the Lord Christ this morning, especially if you are visiting with us today. You are our honored guest in the house of the Lord. And a special welcome to everyone who is here for the baptisms. We're so glad that you're able to be a part of this very special event for your friends and family. You are most welcome at Brick today and at any time. And if everyone could take a moment to sign the Friendship Register, and if you're visiting with us, give us some additional information, such as your email address and telephone number. We'd love to share with you more about what's happening here at Brick Church. And immediately following worship, we will be having a fellowship hour. It'll be through these doors and into the garden room through the breezeway. We hope you'll join us for some coffee, some pastries and refreshments and excellent conversation. This afternoon is the children's pageant at 3 p.m. So hope that you all will come back for that very special time of year in which the children lead us through the Christmas story. And in a unique way, we more deeply understand the gift of God's child that comes into the world. And then a week from today, next Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m., will be the service of lessons and carols. So hopefully you'll mark your Sunday afternoons, this Sunday afternoon and next Sunday afternoon, and come and be a part of the many things happening here at Brick Church. Let us now continue to prepare our hearts and minds for worship of Almighty God. This is the second Sunday that we are celebrating Advent, the time of preparation for the birth of Jesus Christ. Last week, we lit the first purple candle, which represents the hope that God promises us. In our homes, we are preparing for Advent by adding lights to our apartments and homes. These are symbolic of the light of the Advent candles and the hope that Jesus brings. Today is the second Sunday of Advent, 
we light a second purple candle, the candle of peace. It reminds us that our world is not always peaceful and that sometimes people hurt other people. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Hark, the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. During Advent, we pray that all people will seek God's peace. We remember that the angels told the shepherds about the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah called Jesus, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, Prince of Peace. Let us join together in our unison prayer, saying, Heavenly Father, creator of the world, thank you for the promise of peace. Guide us as we prepare for the coming of Jesus Christ, who brings light to the world. Amen. Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. To you alone we dedicate this gathering, faithful God. Thank you for your generosity and grace which unite us in worship this morning. As we exalt you for all the generations here in gathered, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, we pray. And may God's spirit renew our spirits so we may be like Christ, our Messiah, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As mortals, we sin in our thoughts and our words, in what we do and in what we fail to do. With penitence, 
Let us come before God in confession. God, by your word, you created the world and everything in it. Through the gift of your word, heralds have given us hope beyond hope of good news and great joy, but we have muted your messengers and spoken our own words of cynicism and doubt. In this season of new birth, grant us not only listening ears, but fervent hearts, eager to believe and to act as your angels. That is, messengers of your grace. Amen. God's word declares, blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, in whose spirit is no deceit. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Alleluia. Amen. As we are forgiven and reconciled to go through Christ Jesus, let us be reconciled to each other. The peace of the Lord be with you all and also with you. Let us greet one another in the name of Christ. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. By the water and Holy Spirit, we are made members of the church, the body of Christ, and joined to Christ's ministry of love, peace, and justice. On behalf of the session of the Brick Presbyterian Church, I present these parents who are bringing their children for baptism. Cy Cabria and Amanda Hool, Ross Andrew Oliver and Matthew Ryan Taig, Thomas Lawson Melton and Sarah Claire Pritchard, James Vallis Powers II and Ashley Elizabeth Powers and Suzanne Winters Wilson.
I put these questions to you as the parents of these children. Do you desire that your children be baptized? Do you? Relying on the grace of God, do you promise to live the Christian faith and to nurture your children in that faith? Do you? Do you renounce all evil and powers in the world which defy God's love and righteousness? Do you? And do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you? I now put this question to you, the godparents of these children. Do you promise as the godparents of these children through prayer and example to support and encourage them in the Christian faith? Do you? Do we, as members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to guide and nurture these children by word and deed, by love and prayer, encouraging them to know and follow Christ, and by our fellowship, strengthen their family ties to the household of God. Do we? We do. Please pray with me. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish all living things by the gift of water. In the beginning, your spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling for order and life. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into freedom. In the waters of the Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed with your spirit. By his death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to life eternal. We thank you, O God, for the water of baptism. For in it we are buried with Christ in his death, and from it we are raised to share in his resurrection. Pour out your spirit upon us and upon this water, that this font may be the womb of new birth. May these children be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind them to the household of faith, guard them from all evil, and strengthen them to serve you with joy. Amen. What is your name? Juliet. Juliet. Juliet, your name means youthful. And I pray that you may have that childlike faith, embracing God's love your whole life. Juliet Lee, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. There's the one. And what is your name? Isabel. Isabel, your name means pledged to God. And I pray that all of God's promises come to life in your heart your whole life long. Isabel, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Name your child. Mariana Eleanor. Mariana Eleanor. Mariana, your name. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Mariana, your name means star of grace. And I pray that that guiding star of Bethlehem and God's grace guides you your whole life long. Mariana Eleanor, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Name your child. Nell, Nell Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Nell Elizabeth. Nell Elizabeth. Elizabeth means God is my promise. And I pray that all God's promises be upon you your whole life long. And Nell Elizabeth, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And what is the name of your child? James Vallis. James Vallis. James Vallis. Vallis means vale or valley, James. And I pray that whether you are going through pleasant valleys or difficult valleys, that God might grant you a sense of peace. Look at the water. James Vallis, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh. Name your child. James Winters. James Winters. James, your name means may God protect. And James, I pray that you feel God's protection every step of life. James Winters, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
And now I want you all to hear your very first children's sermon. Because at your baptism, God shows you that for you, Jesus was born and came into the world. And that for you, he lived and he showed God's love. And that for you, he suffered the depths of Calvary and he said, it is finished. For you, he triumphed over the grave and rose to newness of life. And he did all of this for you before you knew anything. Oh Lord, uphold these children by your spirit. Give them a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and of might, a spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord, and a spirit of joy in God's presence, both now and forever. Amen. And the children may go to uh, the children's pageant rehearsal or elsewhere. Not sure where. Yes. John the Baptist's role as God's herald brings a frightful message, but his call to baptism has brought us the most endearing tradition within the Christian church. Mark leaves out these details because perhaps realizes it is too easy to miss the core of his message by being distracted by his appearance and fiery rhetoric. Let us then listen with unbiased ears as God's word speaks to us. Let us pray. God of baptism and hope, may your word lead us through repentance into a faithful and fruitful life. Amen. Mark chapter one, verses one through eight. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. On April 18th, 1775, Dr. Joseph Warren learned through Boston's revolutionary underground that British troops were preparing to cross the Charles River and march into Lexington, 
presumably to arrest leaders of the revolutionary movement, Samuel Adams and John Hancock. Fearing an intercept by the British, Warren had devised a redundancy plan to send warning, one by land and one by sea. He had given a silversmith the easier route by way of the sea and a tanner a route by land. This tanner had the more dangerous mission and set off at 9 p.m. He found his way to a British checkpoint and according to at least one account, he made his way through by pretending to be a bumbling drunk farmer. And he eventually made it to his location at 12.30 in the morning where he met up with his fellow town crier their mission had succeeded, and they decided to go on to Concord. On the way, the silversmith was captured by the British, but once again, the tanner escaped, this time by concocting a ruse that there was a trap laid for the British soldiers. Now, in the end, this ride was successful, and I know you know the name of the silversmith. But the tanner's name has largely faded into obscurity. Does anyone know it? William Dawes faded into obscurity, while, of course, Paul Revere has been heralded for centuries since. It's hard to tell how history chooses to who to remember and whom to forget. But either way, both of these men were respected members of society and very clear choices for town criers to herald the coming of the British. But scripture is fascinating, not only in who it chooses to remember, but especially whom it chooses to be God's herald. This week, that herald is the rabble-rouser, the obscure, the nonconformist, somebody much more likely to be forgotten by history than William Dawes. And yet, it's the very first verses of Mark's Gospel that tell the story of this herald, the wild-eyed man from the wilderness, John the Baptizer, who spoke with even more urgency than those on that midnight ride for he came not to warn of an enemy assault, but of the coming wrath of God and the arrival of the Lord's anointed, the Messiah. In Roman times, heralds were quite common. They would announce the coming of the emperor, hailing his kingdom and lauding the emperor specifically as savior and deliverer. And they went on to explain in the Greek, that the arrival of the emperor was euangelion, which means good news. In stark contrast to these Roman heralds, John the Baptist displays an entirely different visage. Rather than pomp and circumstance, surrounded by royal attendants while he's in fine robes, John the Baptist emerges wild-eyed from the wilderness with a hair shirt and locust on his breath. But John does come to announce the arrival of a king and a new kingdom, which God, not the emperor, will reign over. And as you can see, if you listened carefully, the words that the gospel writers use were chosen very deliberately, the same as those hailing the emperor, Savior, good news, king. The gospel writers were trying to present an entirely different worldview for their Hellenistic audience. Jesus, not Caesar as savior, and the good news is not the arrival of a tyrannical emperor, but the coming of a heavenly kingdom where equality and a rule by a loving God will become the norm. Furthermore, this kingdom will not be established by the brutality of Roman soldiers, but rather through the apostles of servanthood and self-sacrifice. And though it comes not by the sword, 
it will require sacrifice. Now, in Matthew's Gospel, we hear more of John's words, who tells, in which he tells the crowds, who warns you to flee from the wrath to come. His fiery rhetoric is important because he's trying to wake up the people who have fallen asleep. He's trying to wake them up to a new kingdom and new possibilities of a new world. He wants to jolt them into what God has coming. And the people listen. They listen to John's word, which prepares them, prepares them to receive Jesus. And after all, that is the primary role of the herald. As one source tells us, that the emperor and kings would send the heralds ahead of them to announce their arrival, to ensure people were prepared once they got there. And that is what we are all doing throughout Advent, preparing for the birth of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, when John the Baptist comes most famously to prepare the way, he does so by telling people to engage in repentance. Now, repentance in our common parlance and understanding means to feel sorry for what you have done and to be determined to do better next time. This is a very logical human approach, self-improvement through sheer force of will. It was Thomas Edison's path to success Listen to what he said about his famous 4,000 attempts to invent the light bulb. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is just to try one more time. And the Hall of Fame football coach Vince Lombardi said, the difference between a successful person and others is not lack of strength or lack of knowledge, but lack of will. Certainly, both of these sayings are wise and true. And I am sure many of you here this morning have used similar drive and similar force of will to succeed in your areas of business and personal life. But unfortunately, the same approach will not work in the life of faith. It requires a different kind of effort and a whole new disposition. Human nature shows us willpower will only get us so far. And eventually, at times, it leads to despair, especially if we think repentance in the life of faith means turning ourselves around. Changing your life by willing to do something different. This time, I'll stick with my diet. This time, I won't lash out to my loved ones with harsh words. This time, this time, this time, I'll get it right. But this is not at all what John the Baptist is talking about. The wording is very important. He does not say, repent and then be baptized. Rather, he calls for a baptism of repentance. We don't repent, or else Jesus wouldn't need to come live, die, and rise again. It's the baptism that does it for us. It's opening ourselves up to the Spirit of God that does it. God changes us. We can change our habits. We can change the words we use. We can change our spending patterns. But we cannot change our souls. 
Only God can do that. Only through faith can we discover our truest selves. And that's what these baptismal waters do. They wash away our pride. They wash away our fear. They wash away our self-doubt. This Advent, take time to remember your own baptism. And if you don't remember it, ask somebody who is there. And realize what this baptism does for you. It not only makes you a part of the family of faith here at Brick, it not only makes you a part of the family of faith of people who professed Jesus throughout this country, it not only connects you to the two billion others throughout this world, but it connects us to the Holy Family of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Baptism has the power to heal and restore. Think about that moment. If you have ever been a sponsor or a godparent or a grandmother or a friend and helped to bring that child forward, and you realize that you're placing all your hopes, your fears, everything in that moment and entrusting them to God. And perhaps it's in that moment as a parent or a godparent that you realize that you can't do it on your own. And then you hear the congregation to promise that they're going to help. Teach your children in Sunday school. And when they grow older, teach them in confirmation and take them on mission trips, and then eventually, perhaps they'll be lighting the Advent candle as a youth elder or youth deacon, or maybe they won't. But you remember all that you put into yourself that day, and as the people of the congregation see these precious, priceless children, you suddenly realize the sheer gift of life of your own existence is an act of grace, that you are here and that you are alive and taking in breaths. And you hold on to the preciousness of life, if only for a moment. And the fog of life that has distracted you, that has dimmed your joy and your faith. If again, if only for a moment, it dissolves away and the fog is clear and the light of love shines forth. So remember your baptism and herald it out to the world. It's what Martin Luther did. Whenever he was feeling despair, he would shout out, I am baptized, and shout it out. For we are heralds not of the message, the British are coming, but rather it is the King of Kings whose life gives us life. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we gather ourselves as a community in prayer, we also want you to have the opportunity to offer your personal prayers confidentially. So immediately following worship, a member of the prayer partners team will be available at the front of the sanctuary to pray with you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of grace and God of peace, 
We thank you for this season of waiting. We thank you for the joy of children waiting for the excitement of gift giving. We thank you for the gift of familiar carols whose joyful music touches waiting hearts. We thank you for widespread family and friends that we cannot wait to see this season. And we thank you, Lord, for the gift of Jesus Christ. We have been waiting for a savior. Lord, hear us now as we offer to you our silent prayers of thanksgiving. God of peace, you have called all of us to work for peace and for justice. Wherever we are, we can find opportunities to stand with people and to identify with their needs and their hopes. We can no longer be silent. Where there is need, there is a task for us. Wherever there is unfulfilled hope, we can be the inspiration of a new future. Lord, help us to not only think of ourselves and the tasks we have during this season, but rather help us to be open to all of those around us who can use our help. Open our eyes and open our hearts that we may see them. Lord, hear our silent prayers of intercession. Loving God, as we approach the day of Christ's birth, help us to throw wide the doors of our hearts in preparation. To remember the words of the angels, the prophets, and the teachers of old, and to celebrate all the promises that you have made through them. Help us to take firm hold of the meaning of all these things and to know in the depths of our being that even now you are seeking to work in us and through us to fulfill the promises that you have made. Lord, may this Christmas season be for us and for those around us a season of healing. May it be a season of hope, of peace, of love, and of joy. May it be a time of true sharing and of rejoicing in all the earth. Lord, hear our silent prayers of petition. Gracious God, throughout the world, in and on and under it, waiting happens. Waiting grows and gathers. The earth is expectant, waiting for redemption. In eager anticipation, we wait for the revelation of the Son of God. So, Lord, be with us this Christmas. Alleluia. Amen. As we come to a time of giving, let's ponder over Paul's words. And God is able to make every grace abound to you, so that in everything, at every time, having every sufficiency, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the needy, his righteousness stands forever. May God's reward be ours as we give. Amen.
Please let us pray. God in heaven, we give because you first gave to us. We thank you for your patience towards us, for all to come to repentance. We pray that you would give us your Holy Spirit afresh and would renew in us your love, your grace, faith, and hope in the season. Thank you for the gospel. As in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
seated. Remembering your baptism is a way of reminding yourself that you are precious in the sight of God. Whatever your faith, I am sure that you have a way in which you find that stillness of life. Perhaps it's a hike in the mountains. Perhaps it's a piece of music. Perhaps it's sitting quietly by a fire. Take that moment out this Advent and remind yourself that indeed you are precious and loved by God and herald that same message to others who are struggling to know that in the depths of their hearts. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace from this moment and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>